Arbitel of Magic Translated into English by Robert Turner Read by Dan Atro If you'd like to support the production of more work such as this, please visit patreon.com slash themodernhermeticist. Preface by Robert Turner To the Unprejudiced Reader As the fall of man made himself and all other creatures subject to vanity, so by reason thereof, the most noble and excellent arts wherewith the rational soul was endued are by the rusty cancer of time brought unto corruption. For magic itself, which the ancients so divinely contemplate, is scandalized with bearing the badge of all diabolical sorceries, which art, saith Pico della Mirandola, pauci intelligunt, multi reprehendunt, et sicut canes ignotos semper alatrant. Few understand, many reprehend, and as dogs bark at those they know not, so do many condemn and hate the things they understand not. Many men there are that abhor the very name and word Magus, because of Simon Magus, who, being not Magus, but Goes, that is, familiar with evil spirits, usurped that title. But magic and witchcraft are far differing sciences, whereof Pliny, being ignorant, scoffeth thereat. For Nero, saith Pliny, who had the most excellent magicians of the East sent to him by Tiridates, king of Armenia, who held that kingdom by him, found the art, after long study and labor, altogether ridiculous. Now, witchcraft and sorcery are works done merely by the devil, which, with respect unto some covenant made with man, he acteth by men his instruments to accomplish his evil ends. Of these, the histories of all ages, people, and countries, as also the holy scriptures, afford us sundry examples. But the magus is a Persian word primitively, whereby is expressed such a one as is altogether conversant in things divine. As Plato affirmeth, the art of magic is the art of worshipping God, and the Persians call their gods magus. Hence Apollonius saith that magus is either ho kakafusin theos, or Therapeutes Theone, that is, that Magus is a name sometime of him that is a god by nature, and sometime of him that is in the service of God, in which latter sense it is taken in Matthew 2, 1 and 2, when the wise men came to worship Jesus. And this is the first and highest kind, which is called divine magic, and these the Latins did entitle sapientes, or wise men. For the fear and worship of God is the beginning of knowledge. These wise men the Greeks call philosophers, and amongst the Egyptians they were termed priests. The Hebrews termed them kabbalistos, prophets, scribes, and Pharisees. And among the Babylonians they were differenced by the name of Chaldeans, and by the Persians they were called magicians. And one speaking of Sosthenes, one of the ancient magicians, useth these words, Et verum deum merita maestate prosequitur, et angulos ministros dei, sed veri eius venerationi novit assistere. Idem daimonas prodit terrenos, vagos, humanitatis inimicos. Sosthenes ascribeth the due majesty to the true God, and acknowledgeth that his angels are ministers and messengers which attend the worship of the true God. He also hath delivered that there are devils, earthly and wandering, and enemies to mankind. So that the word magus of itself imports a contemplator of divine and heavenly sciences, but under the name magic are unlawful arts comprehended, 
as necromancy and witchcraft and such arts which are effected by combination with the devil, and whereof he is party. These witches and necromancers are also called malefici or wenefici, sorcerers or poisoners, of which names witches are rightly called, who, without the art of magic, do indeed use the help of the devil himself to do mischief, practicing to mix the powder of dead bodies with other things by help of the devil prepared, and at other times to make pictures of wax, clay, and otherwise, as it were, sacramentaliter, to effect those things which the devil by other means bringeth to pass. Such were, to this day partly, if not altogether, are the corruptions which have made odious the very name of magic, having chiefly sought, as the manner of all impostures is, to counterfeit the highest and most noble part of it. A second kind of magic is astrology, which judges the events of things to come, natural and human, by the motion and influences of the stars upon the lower elements, by them observed and understood. Philo Judaeus affirmeth that by this part of magic or astrology, together with the motions of the stars and other heavenly bodies, Abraham found out the knowledge of the true God while he lived in Chaldea, qui contemplatione creaturarum cognovit creatorem, said Damasen, who knew the Creator by the contemplation of the creature. Josephus reporteth of Abraham that he instructed the Egyptians in arithmetic and astronomy, who, before Abraham's coming unto them, knew none of these sciences. Abraham sanctitate et sapientia omnium praestantissimus primum caldeos, de inde foinices, demum Egyptios sacerdotes, astrologia et divina docuerit. Abraham, the holiest and wisest of men, did first teach the Chaldeans, then the Phoenicians, lastly the Egyptian priests, astrology and divine knowledge. Without doubt, Hermes Trismegistus, that divine magician and philosopher, who, as some say, lived long before Noah, attained to much divine knowledge of the Creator through the study of magic and astrology, as his writings to this day extant among us do testify. The third kind of magic containeth the whole philosophy of nature, which bringeth to light the inmost virtues and extracteth them out of nature's hidden bosom to human use. Virtutes in centro centri latentes, virtues hidden in the center of the center, according to the chemists. Of this sort were Albertus, Arnoldus de Villanova, Raymond Lull, Bacon, and others, etc. The magic these men professed is thus defined. Magia est connexio a viro sapiente agentium per naturam cum patientibus sibi congruente respondentibus, ut inde opera prodeant, non sine eorum admiratione qui causam ignorant. Magic is the connection of natural agents and patients, answerable each to other, wrought by a wise man, to the bringing forth of such effects as are wonderful to those that know not their causes. In all these Zoroaster was well learned, especially in the first and highest. For in his oracles he confesseth God to be the first and the highest. He believeth of the Trinity, which he would not investigate by any natural knowledge. He speaketh of angels and of paradise, approveth the immortality of the soul, teacheth truth, faith, hope, and love, discoursing on the abstinence and charity of the Magi. Of this Zoroaster, Eusebius in the theology of the Phoenicians, using Zoroaster's own words, haec ad verbum scribit, saith Eusebius, Deus primus incorruptibilium sempiternus 
ingenitus, expers partium sibi ipsi similimus, banorum omnium auriga, munera non expectans, optimus, prudentissimus, pater iuris, sine doctrina justitiam per doctus, natura perfectus, sapiens, sacrae naturae unicus inventor, et caetera. Thus saith Zoroaster, word for word, God the first, incorruptible, everlasting, unbegotten, without parts, most like himself, the guide of all good, expecting no reward, the best, the wisest, the father of right, having learned justice without teaching, perfect, wise by nature, the only inventor thereof. So that a magician is no other but divinorum cultor et interpres, a studious observer and expounder of divine things. And the art itself is none other quam naturalis philosophiae absoluta consumatio, that is, none other than the absolute perfection of natural philosophy. Nevertheless, there is a mixture in all things, good with evil, of falsehood with truth, of corruption with purity. The good, the truth, the purity in every kind may well be embraced, as in the ancient worshipping of God by sacrifice, there was no man knowing God among the elders that did not forbear to worship the God of all power, or condemn that kind of worship, because the devil was so adored in the image of Baal, Dagon, Astaroth, Shamash, Jupiter, Apollo, and the like. Neither did the abuse of astrology terrify Abraham, if we believe the most ancient and religious writers, from observing the motions and natures of the heavenly bodies. Neither can it dehort wise and learned men in these days from attributing those virtues, influences, and inclinations to the stars and other lights of heaven which God hath given to those his glorious creatures. I must expect some calumnies and obtractations against this from the malicious, prejudiced men and the lazy affectors of ignorance of whom this age swarms. But the voice and sound of the snake and goose is all one. But our stomachs are not now so queasy and tender after so long time feeding upon solid divinity, nor are we so umbrageous and startling, having been so long enlightened in God's path, that we should relapse into that childish age in which Aristotle's metaphysics in a council in France, was forbid to be read. But I incite the reader to a charitable opinion thereof, with a Christian protestation of an innocent purpose therein, and entreat the reader to follow this advice of Tabeus, qui litigant sint ambo in conspectu tuo mali et rei. And if there be any scandal in this enterprise of mine, it is taken, not given. And this comfort I have in the axiom of Trismegistus, qui pius est summe philosophatur. And therefore I present it without disguise, and object it to all of candor and indifference. And of readers, of whom there be four sorts, as one observes, sponges which attract all without distinguishing, hourglasses, which receive and pour out as fast. Bags, which retain only the dregs of spices and let the wine escape. And sieves, which retain the best only. Some there are of the last sort, and to them I present this occult philosophy, knowing that they may reap good thereby. And they who are severe against it, they all pardon this my opinion, that such their severity proceeds from self-guiltiness, and give me leave to apply that of an odious, that is the nature of self-wickedness, to think that of others which they themselves deserve. 
and it is all the comfort which the guilty have, not to find any innocent. But that amongst others this may find some acceptance is the desire of this translator, Robert Turner. Arbitel of the Magic of the Ancients The Greatest Study of Wisdom In all things ask counsel of the Lord, and do not thou think, speak, or do anything, wherein God is not thy counselor. Proverbs 11 He that walketh fraudulently revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Arbitel of Magic Or the spiritual wisdom of the ancients, as well wise men of the people of God as magi of the Gentiles, for the illustration of the glory of God and his love to mankind. Now first of all produced out of darkness into the light, against all cacomagicians and contemners of the gifts of God, for the profit and delectation of all those who do truly and piously love the creatures of God, and do use them with thanksgiving, to the honor of God, and the profit of themselves, and their neighbors. Containing nine tomes, and seven septenaries of aphorisms. The first is called Isagogy, or a book of the institutions of magic, or pneumatiques, which in forty and nine aphorisms comprehendeth the most general precepts of the whole art. The second is called microcosmical magic, but microcosmus hath effected magically by his spirit and genius addicted to him from his nativity, that is, spiritual wisdom, and how the same is effected. The third is Olympic magic, and what manner a man may do and suffer by the spirits of Olympus. The fourth is Hesiodical and Homerical magic, which teacheth the operations by the spirits called cacodaimones, as it were, not adversaries to mankind. The fifth is Roman or Sibylline magic, which acteth and operates with tutelar spirits and lords, to whom the whole orb of the earth is distributed. This is Walde Insignis Magia, to this the doctrine of the Druids referred. The sixth is Pythagorical magic, which only acteth with spirits to whom is given the doctrine of arts, as physic, medicine, mathematics, alchemy, and such like arts. The seventh is the magic of Apollonius and the like, and agreeeth with the Roman and microcosmical magic, only it hath this peculiar, that it hath power over the hostile part of mankind. The eighth is hermetical, that is, Egyptiacal magic, and differeth not much from divine magic. The ninth is that wisdom which dependeth solely upon the word of God, and this is called prophetical magic. The first tome of the book of Arbitel of Magic, called Isagogy. In the name of the Creator, and all things both visible and invisible, who revealeth his mysteries out of his treasures to them that call upon him, and fatherly and mercifully bestoweth those his secrets upon us without measure. May he grant unto us, through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, his ministering spirits, the revealers of his secrets, that we may write this book of Arbitel concerning the greatest secrets, which are lawful for man to know, and to use them without offense unto God. Amen. The First Septenary of Aphorisms 
The First Aphorism Whosoever would know secrets, let him know how to keep secret things secretly, and to reveal those things that are to be revealed, and to seal those things which are to be sealed, and not to give holy things to dogs, nor cast pearls before swine. Observe this law, and the eyes of thy understanding shall be opened to understand secret things, and thou shalt have whatsoever thy mind desireth to be divinely revealed unto thee. Thou shalt also have the angels and spirits of God prompt and ready in their nature to minister unto thee as much as any human mind can desire. Aphorism 2 In all things call upon the name of the Lord and without prayer unto God through his only begotten Son, do not thou undertake to do or think anything, and use the spirits given and attributed unto thee as ministers without rashness and presumption as the messengers of God, having a due reverence towards the Lord of spirits. And the remainder of thy life do thou accomplish, demeaning thyself peaceable to the honor of God and the profit of thyself and thy neighbor. Aphorism 3 Live to thyself and the muses. Avoid the friendship of the multitude. Be thou covetous of time, beneficial to all men. Use thy gifts, be vigilant in thy calling, and let the word of God never depart from thy mouth. Aphorism 4 Be obedient to good admonitions. Avoid all procrastination. Accustom thyself to constancy and gravity, both in thy words and deeds. Resist temptations of the tempter by the word of God. Flee from earthly things. Seek after heavenly things. Put no confidence in thy own wisdom, but look unto God in all things, according to that sentence of Scripture, When we know not what we shall do, unto thee, O God, do we lift up our eyes, and from thee we expect our help. For where all human refuges do forsake us, there will the help of God shine forth, according to the saying of Philo. Aphorism 6 Whatsoever thou hast learned, frequently repeat and fix the same in thy mind, and learn much, but not many things, because a human understanding cannot be alike capable in all things, unless it be such a one that is divinely regenerated. Unto him nothing is so difficult or manifold, which he may not be able equally to attain to. Aphorism 7 Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will hear thee, and thou shalt glorify me, saith the Lord. For all ignorance is tribulation of the mind. Therefore, call upon the Lord in thy ignorance, and he will hear thee. And remember that thou give honor unto God, and say with the psalmist, Not unto us, Lord, but unto thy name give the glory. The Second Septenary Aphorism 8 Even as the scripture testifies that God appointeth names to things or persons, and also with them hath distributed certain powers and offices out of his treasures, so the characters and names of stars have not any power by reason of their figure or pronunciation, but by reason of the virtue or office which God hath ordained by nature, either to such a name or character. For there is no power either in heaven or in earth or hell which doth not descend from God, and without his permission they can neither give or draw forth into any action anything they have. 
Aphorism 9 That is the chiefest wisdom, which is from God. And next, that which is in spiritual creatures. Afterwards, in corporeal creatures. Fourthly, in nature and natural things. The spirits that are apostate and reserved to the last judgment do follow these after a long interval. Sixthly, the ministers of punishments in hell and the obedient unto God. Seventhly, the pygmies do not possess the lowest place, and they who inhabit in the elements and elementary things. It is convenient, therefore, to know and discern all differences of the wisdom of the Creator and the creatures, that it may be certainly manifest to us what we ought to assume to our use of every thing, and that we may know in truth how and in what manner that may be done. For truly every creature is ordained for some profitable end to human nature, and for the service thereof, as the Holy Scriptures, reason, and experience do testify. Aphorism 10 God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, in the Holy Scriptures proposeth himself to have an eye over us, and as a tender father which loveth his children, he teacheth us what is profitable and what not, what we are to avoid and what we are to embrace. Then he allureth us to obedience with great promises of corporal and eternal benefits, and deterreth us with threatening of punishments from those things which are not profitable for us. Turn over, therefore, with thy hand, both night and day, those holy writings, that thou mayest be happy in things present, and blessed in all eternity. Do this, and thou shalt live, which the holy books have taught thee. Aphorism 11 A number of four is Pythagorical and the first quadrate. Therefore, here let us place the foundation of all wisdom, after the wisdom of God revealed in the Holy Scriptures, and to the considerations proposed in nature. Appoint therefore to him who solely dependeth upon God the wisdom of every creature to serve and obey him, nolens volens, willing or unwilling. And in this, the omnipotency of God shineth forth. It consisteth therefore in this, that we will discern the creatures which serve us from those that are unwilling, and that we may learn how to accommodate the wisdom and office of every creature unto ourselves. This art is not delivered, but divinely. Unto whom God will, he revealeth his secrets, but to whom he will not bestow anything out of his treasuries, that person shall attain to nothing without the will of God. Therefore we ought to desire from God alone, which will mercifully impart these things unto us. For he who hath given us his Son, and commanded us to pray for his Holy Spirit, how much more will he subject unto us the whole creature, and things visible and invisible. Whatsoever ye ask, ye shall receive. Beware that ye do not abuse the gifts of God, and all things shall work together unto you for your salvation. And before all things be watchful in this, that your names be written in heaven. This is more light, that the spirits be obedient unto you, as Christ admonisheth. Aphorism 12 In the Acts of the Apostles, the Spirit saith unto Peter after the vision, Go down, and doubt not, but I have sent them, when he was sent for from Cornelius the Centurion. After this manner, in vocal words, are all disciplines delivered by the holy angels of God, as it appeareth out of the monuments of the Egyptians. 
And these things afterwards were vitiated and corrupted with human opinions, and by the instigation of evil spirits, who sow tears amongst the children of disobedience, as it is manifest out of St. Paul and Hermes Trismegistus. There is no other manner of restoring these arts than by the doctrine of the Holy Spirits of God, because true faith cometh by hearing. But because thou mayest be certain of the truth, and mayest not doubt whether the spirits that speak with thee do declare things true or false, let it only depend upon thy faith in God, and thou mayest say with Paul, I know on whom I trust. If no sparrow can fall to the ground without the will of the Father which is in heaven, how much more will not God suffer thee to be deceived, O thou of little faith, if thou dependest wholly upon God, and adherest only to him? Aphorism 13 The Lord liveth, and all things which live do live in him, and he is truly yod He vav He who hath given unto all things that they be that which they are. And by his word alone, through his Son, hath produced all things out of nothing, which are in being. He calleth all the stars, and all the hosts of heaven by their names. He therefore knoweth the true strength and nature of things, the order and policy of every creature, visible and invisible, to whom God hath revealed the names of his creatures. It remaineth also that he receive the power from God to extract the virtues in nature and hidden secrets out of the creature, and to produce their power into action out of darkness into light. Thy scope, therefore, ought to be that thou have the names of the spirits, that is, their powers and offices, and how they are subjected and appointed by God to minister unto thee, even as Raphael was sent to Tobias, that he should heal his father, and deliver his son from dangers, and bring him to a wife. So Michael, the fortitude of God, governeth the people of God. Gabriel, the messenger of God, was sent to Daniel, Mary, and Zachary, the father of John the Baptist. And he shall be given to thee that desirest him, who will teach thee whatsoever thy soul shall desire in the nature of things. His ministry thou shalt use with trembling and fear of thy Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, that is to say, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And do not thou let slip any occasion of learning, and be vigilant in thy calling, and thou shalt want nothing that is necessary for thee. Aphorism 14 Thy soul liveth forever through him that hath created thee. Call therefore upon the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. This thou shalt do, If thou wilt perform that end for which thou art ordained of God, and what thou owest to God and to thy neighbor. God requireth of thee a mind, that thou shouldst honor his Son, and keep the words of his Son in thy heart. If thou honor him, thou hast done the will of thy Father, which is in heaven. To thy neighbor thou owest offices of humanity, and that thou draw all men that come to thee to honor the Son. This is the law and the prophets. In temporal things, thou oughtest to call upon God as a father, that he would give unto thee all necessaries of this life, and thou oughtest to help thy neighbor with the gifts which God bestoweth upon thee, whether they be spiritual or corporal. Therefore, Thou shalt pray thus. O Lord of heaven and earth, creator and maker of all things visible and invisible, I, though unworthy, by thy assistance call upon thee, 
through thy only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, that thou wilt give unto me thy Holy Spirit, to direct me in thy truth unto all good. Amen. Because I earnestly desire perfectly to know the arts of this life, and such things as are necessary for us, which are so overwhelmed in darkness, and polluted with infinite human opinions, that I of my own power can attain to no knowledge in them, unless thou teach it me. Grant me, therefore, one of thy spirits, who may teach me those things which thou wouldst have me to know and learn, and thy praise and glory, and the profit of our neighbor. Give me also an apt and teachable heart, that I may easily understand those things which thou shalt teach me, and may hide them in my understanding, that I may bring them forth, as out of thy inexhaustible treasures, to all necessary uses. And give me grace, that I may use such thy gifts humbly, with fear and trembling, through our Lord Jesus Christ, with thy Holy Spirit. Amen. The Third Septenary Aphorism 15 They are called Olympic spirits, which do inhabit in the firmament, and in the stars of the firmament. And the office of these spirits is to declare destinies, and to administer fatal charms, so far forth as God pleaseth to permit them. For nothing, neither evil spirit nor evil destiny, shall be able to hurt him who hath the Most High for his refuge. If, therefore, any of the Olympic spirits shall teach or declare that which his star to which he is appointed portendeth, nevertheless he can bring forth nothing into action unless he be permitted by the divine power. It is God alone who giveth them power to effect it. Unto God, the Maker of all things, are obedient all things celestial, sublunary, and infernal. Therefore, rest in this. Let God be thy guide in all things which thou undertakest, and all things shall attain to a happy and desired end, even as the history of the whole world testifieth, and daily experience showeth. There is peace to the godly, there is no peace to the wicked, saith the Lord. Aphorism 16 There are seven different governments of the spirits of Olympus by whom God hath appointed the whole frame and universe of this world to be governed, and their visible stars are Arathon, Bethor, Phaleg, Och, Hagit, Ophiel, and Fool, after the Olympic speech. Every one of these hath under him a mighty militia in the firmament. Arathon ruleth visible provinces, 49. Bethor, 32, or 42. Phaleg, 35, Och, 28, Hagith, 21, Ophiel, 14, and Fool, 7. So that there are 186, or 196, Olympic provinces in the whole universe, wherein the seven governors do exercise their power all which are elegantly set forth in astronomy. But in this place is to be explained in what manner these princes and powers may be drawn into communication. Aratron appeareth in the first hour of Saturday, and very truly giveth answers concerning his provinces and provincials. So likewise do the rest appear in order in their days and hours, also every one of them ruleth four hundred and ninety years. The beginning of their simple anomaly, in the sixtieth year before the nativity of Christ, was the beginning of the administration of Bethor, and it lasted until the year of our Lord Christ, 
430, to whom succeeded Phalek until the 920th year. Then began Och, and continued until the year 1410, and thenceforth Hagith ruleth until the year 1900. Aphorism 17 Magically, the princes of the seven governors are called simply, in that time, day, and hour, wherein they rule visibly or invisibly, by their names and offices which God hath given unto them, and by proposing their character which they have given or confirmed. The governor Aratron hath in his power those things which he doth naturally, that is, after the same manner and subject as those things which in astronomy are ascribed to the power of Saturn. Those things which he doth of his own free will are 1. That he can convert anything into a stone in a moment, either animal or plant, retaining the same object to the sight. 2. He converteth treasures into coals, and coals into treasures. 3. He giveth familiars with a definite power. 4. He teacheth alchemy, magic, and physic. 5. He reconcileth the subterranean spirits to men, maketh hairy men. 6. He causeth one to be invisible. 7. The barren he maketh fruitful, and giveth long life. He hath under him forty-nine kings, forty-two princes, thirty-five presidents, twenty-eight dukes, twenty-one ministers standing before him, fourteen familiars, and seven messengers. He commandeth thirty-six thousand legions of spirits. The number of a legion is four hundred and ninety. Betor governeth those things which are ascribed to Jupiter. He soon cometh being called. He that is dignified with his character, he raiseth to very great dignities, to cast open treasures. He reconcileth the spirits of the air, that they give true answers. They transport precious stones from place to place, and they make medicines to work miraculously in their effects. He giveth also familiars of the firmament, and prolongeth life to seven hundred years, if God will. He hath under him forty-two kings, thirty-five princes, twenty-eight dukes, twenty-one counsellors, Fourteen ministers, seven messengers, twenty nine thousand legions of spirits. Phaleg ruleth those things which are attributed to Mars, the Prince of Peace. He that hath his character, he raiseth to great honours in warlike affairs. His character. Och governeth solar things. He giveth six hundred years with perfect health. He bestoweth great wisdom, giveth most excellent spirits, teacheth perfect medicines. He converteth all things into most pure gold and precious stones. He giveth gold and a purse springing with gold. He that is dignified with his character he maketh him to be worshipped as a deity by the kings of the whole world. He hath under him thirty-six thousand five hundred and thirty-six legions. He administereth all things alone, and all his spirits serve him by centuries. Haggith governeth venereous things. He that is dignified with his character, he maketh very fair, and to be adorned with all beauty. He converteth copper into gold in a moment, and gold into copper. He giveth spirits which do faithfully serve those to whom they are addicted. He hath four thousand legions of spirits, and over every thousand 
he ordaineth kings for their appointed seasons. Ophiel is the governor of such things as are attributed to Mercury. His spirits are a hundred thousand legions. He easily giveth familiar spirits. He teacheth all arts. And he that is dignified with his character, he maketh him able to in a moment convert quicksilver into the philosopher's stone. Fool changeth all metals into silver, in word and deed. He governeth lunary things, healeth the dropsy, he giveth spirits of the water, who do serve men in a corporeal and visible form, and maketh men to live three hundred years. The most general precepts of this secret. 1. Every governor acteth with all his spirits, either naturally, to wit, always after the same manner, or otherwise of their own free will, if God hinder them not. 2. Every governor is able to do all things which are done naturally in a long time, out of matter before prepared and also to do them suddenly, out of matter not before prepared. As Och, the prince of solar things, prepareth gold in the mountains in a long time, in less time by the chemical art, and magically in a moment. 3. The true and divine magician may use all the creatures of God, and offices of the governors of the world at his own will, for that the governors of the world are obedient, and come when they are called, and do execute their commands. But God is the author thereof, as Joshua causes the sun to stand still in heaven. They send some of their spirits to the mean magicians, which do obey them only in some determinate business. But they hear not the false magicians, but expose them to the deceits of the devils, and cast them into diverse dangers by the command of God, as the prophet Jeremiah testifieth in his eighth chapter concerning the Jews. 4. In all the elements there are the seven governors with their hosts, who do move with the equal motion of the firmament, and the inferiors do always depend upon the superiors, as is taught in philosophy. 5. A man that is a true magician is brought forth a magician from his mother's womb. Others, who do give themselves to this office, are unhappy. This is that which John the Baptist speaketh of. No man can do anything of himself, except it be given him from above. 6. Every character given from a spirit, for what cause soever, has this efficacy in this business for which it is given in the time prefixed. But it is to be used the same day and planetary hour wherein it is given. 7. God liveth, and thy soul liveth. Keep thy covenant, and thou hast whatever the Spirit shall reveal unto thee in God, because all things shall be done which the Spirit promiseth unto thee. Aphorism 18 There are other names of the Olympic spirits delivered by others, but they only are effectual which are delivered to any one by the Spirit the Revealer, visible or invisible and they are delivered to every one as they are predestinated. Therefore, they are called constellations, and they seldom have any efficacy above forty, that is, a hundred and forty, years. Therefore, it is most safe for the young practicers of the art that they work by the offices of the spirits alone, without their names. And if they are preordained to attain the art of magic, the other parts of the art will offer themselves unto them of their own accord. Pray, therefore, for a constant faith, and God will bring to pass all things in due season. 
Aphorism 19 Olympus and the inhabitants thereof do of their own accord offer themselves to men in the forms of spirits, and are ready to perform their offices for them, whether they will or not. By how much the rather will they attend you if they are desired? But there do appear also evil spirits and destroyers, which is caused by the envy and malice of the devil. And because men do allure and draw them unto themselves with their sins, as a punishment due to sinners. Whosoever therefore desireth familiarity to have a conversation with spirits, let him keep himself from enormous sins, and diligently pray to the Most High to be his keeper, and he shall break through all the snares and impediments of the devil, and let him apply himself to the service of God, and he will give him an increase in wisdom. Aphorism 20 All things are possible to them that believe them and are willing to receive them, but to the incredulous and unwilling, all things are impossible. There is no greater hindrance than a wavering mind, levity, unconstancy, foolish babbling, drunkenness, lust, and disobedience to the word of God. A magician, therefore, ought to be a man that is godly, honest, constant in his words and deeds, having a firm faith toward God, prudent, and covetous of nothing, but of wisdom about divine things. Aphorism 21 When you would call any of the Olympic spirits, observe the rising of the sun that day, and of what the nature of the spirit is which you desire. And saying the prayer following, your desires shall be perfected. Omnipotent and eternal God, who hast ordained the whole creation for thy praise and glory, and for the salvation of man, I beseech thee that thou wouldst send thy spirit, N. N. of the solar order, who shall inform and teach me those things which I shall ask of him, or that he may bring me medicine against the dropsy, etc. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine, through Jesus Christ, thy only begotten Son, our Lord. Amen. But thou shalt not detain the spirit above a full hour, unless he be familiarly addicted unto thee. For as much as thou camest in peace, and quietly, and hath answered unto my petitions, I give thanks unto God, in whose name thou camest. And now thou mayest depart in peace unto thy orders, and return to me again, when I shall call thee by thy name, or by thy order, or by thy office, which is granted from the Creator. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 be not rash with thy mouth, neither let thy heart be hasty to utter any thing before God. For God is in heaven, and thou in earth. Therefore, let thy words be few, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business. The third, though really the fourth, septenary. Aphorism 22 we call that a secret which no man can attain unto by human industry without revelation, which science lieth obscured, hidden by God in the creature, which nevertheless he doth permit to be revealed by spirits to a due use of the thing itself. And these secrets are either concerning things divine, natural, or human. But thou mayest examine a few, and the most select, which thou wilt commend with many more. Aphorism 23 Make a beginning of the nature of the secret, either by a spirit in the form of a person, or by virtues separate, either in human organs, or by what manner soever the same may be effected. And this being known, require of a spirit which knoweth that art, 
that he would briefly declare unto thee whatsoever that secret is, and pray unto God that he would inspire thee with his grace, whereby thou mayest bring the secret to the end thou desireth, for the praise and glory of God, and the profit of thy neighbor. Aphorism 24 The greatest secrets are in number seven. The first is the curing of all diseases in the space of seven days, either by character or by natural things, or by the superior spirits with the divine assistance. The second is to be able to prolong life to whatsoever age we please. I say a corporal and natural life. The third is to have the obedience of the creatures in the elements which are the forms of the personal spirits, also all pygmies, sagani, nymphs, dryads, and spirits of the woods. The third is to have the obedience of the creatures in the elements which are in the forms of personal spirits, also all pygmies, sagani, nymphs, dryads, and spirits of the woods. The fourth is, to be able to discourse with knowledge and understanding of all things visible and invisible, and to understand the power of every thing, and to what it belongeth. The fifth is, that a man be able to govern himself according to that end which God hath appointed him. The sixth is, to know God and Christ and his Holy Spirit. This is the perfection of the microcosm. The seventh, to be regenerate as Anocius, the king of the inferior world. These seven secrets a man of an honest and constant mind may learn of the spirits without any offense unto God. The mean secrets are likewise seven in number. The first is the transmutation of metals, which is vulgarly called alchemy, which certainly is given to very few, and not but of special grace. The second is the curing of diseases with metals, either by the magnetic virtues of precious stones, or by the use of the philosopher's stone and the like. The third is to be able to perform astronomical and mathematical miracles, such as are the hydraulic engines, to administer business by the influence of heaven, and things which are of the like sort. The fourth is to perform the works of natural magic, of what sort soever they be. The fifth is to know all physical secrets. The sixth is to know the foundation of all arts which are exercised with the hands and offices of the body. The seventh is to know the foundation of all arts which are exercised by the angelical nature of man. The Lesser Secrets are Seven The first is to do a thing diligently, and to gather together much money. The second is to ascend from a mean state to dignities and honors and to establish a newer family which may be illustrious and do great things. The third is to excel in military affairs and happily to achieve to great things and to be a head of the head of kings and princes. To be a good housekeeper both in the country and the city. The fifth is to be an industrious and fortunate merchant. To be a philosopher, mathematician, and physician, according to Aristotle, Plato, Ptolemy, Euclid, Hippocrates, and Galen. To be a divine, according to the Bible and the schools, which all writers of divinity both old and new, have taught.
Aphorism 25 We have already declared what a secret is, the kinds and species thereof. It remaineth now to show how we may attain to know those things which we desire. The true and only way to all secrets is to have recourse unto God, the author of all good. And as Christ teacheth, In the first place seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Also see that your hearts not be burdened with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Also commit your cares unto the Lord, and he will do it. Also I, the Lord thy God, do teach thee what things are profitable for thee, and do guide thee in the way wherein thou walkest. And I will give thee understanding, and will teach thee in the way wherein thou shalt go, and I will guide thee with my eye. Also, if you which are evil know how to give good things to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give his Holy Spirit to them that ask him? If you will do the will of my Father which is in heaven, ye are truly my disciples, and we will come unto you, and make our abode with you. If you draw these seven places of Scripture from the letter unto the Scripture, or into action, thou canst not err, but shalt attain to the desired bound. Thou shalt not err from the mark, and God himself by his Holy Spirit will teach thee true and profitable things. He will give also his ministering angels unto thee, to be thy companions, helpers and teachers of all the secrets of the world. And he will command every creature to be obedient unto thee, so that cheerfully rejoicing, thou mayest say with the apostles, that the spirits are obedient unto thee. So that at length thou shalt be certain of the greatest thing of all, that thy name is written in heaven. Aphorism 26 There is another way which is more common, that secrets may be revealed unto thee also, when thou art unwitting thereof, either by God or by spirits which have secrets in their power, or by dreams, or by strong imaginations and impressions or by the constellation of a nativity by celestial knowledge. After this manner are made heroic men, such as there are very many, and all learned men in the world, Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, Galen, Euclid, Archimedes, Hermes Trismegistus, the father of secrets, with Theophrastus, Paracelsus, all which men had in themselves all the virtues of secrets. Hitherto also are referred Homer, Hesiod, Orpheus, Pythagoras, but these had not such gifts of secret as the former. To this are referred the nymphs and sons of Melusina, and gods of the Gentiles, Achilles, Aeneas, Hercules, also Cyrus, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Lucullus, Sulla, and Marius. It is a canon that everyone know his own angel and that he obey him according to the word of God. And let him beware of the snares of the evil angel, lest he be involved in the calamities of Brute and Marcus Antonius. To this refer to the book of Jovianus Pontanus, of Fortune, and his Eutychus. The third way is diligence and hard labor without which no great thing can be obtained from the divine deity worthy of admiration, as is said by Horace, Ars Poetica 385, Tu nihil invita dices faciesue Minerva. Nothing canst thou do or say against Minerva's will. We do detest all evil magicians who make themselves associates with the devil and their unlawful superstitions and do obtain and effect some things which God permitteth to be done, instead of the punishment of the devils. 
so also they do their other evil acts, the devil being the author, as the scripture testify of Judas. To these are referred all idolaters of old, and of our age, and abusers of fortune, such as the heathens are full of, and to these do appertain all charontic evocations of spirits, the works of Saul with the woman, and Lucan's prophecy of the deceased soldier concerning the events of the Pharsalian War, and the like. Aphorism 27 Make a circle with a center, A, which is B, C, D, E. At the east, let there be B, C, a square. At the north, C, D. At the west, D, E. And at the south, E, B. Divide the several quadrants into seven parts, that there may be in the whole twenty-eight parts. And let them be again divided into four parts that there may be a hundred and twelve parts of the circle, and so many are the true secrets to be revealed. And this circle, in this manner divided, is the seal of the secrets of the world, which they draw from the only center, A, that is, from the invisible God, unto the whole creature. The prince of the oriental secrets is resident in the middle, and hath three nobles on either side. Every one whereof hath four under him, and the prince himself hath four appertaining unto him. And in this manner the other princes and nobles have their quadrants of secrets with their four secrets. But the oriental secret is the study of all wisdom. The west, of strength. The south, of tillage. The north, of of more rigid life, so that the eastern secrets are commended to be the best, the meridian to be mean, and the west and north to be lesser. The use of this seal of secrets is that thereby thou mayest know whence the spirits or angels are produced, which may teach the secrets delivered unto them from God. But they have names taken from their offices and powers, according to the gift which God hath severally distributed to every one of them. One hath the power of the sword, another of pestilence, and another of inflicting famine upon the people, as it is ordained by God. Some are destroyers of cities, as those two were who were sent to overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah, and the places adjacent, examples whereof the Holy Scripture witnesseth. Some are the watchmen over kingdoms, other the keepers of private persons, and from thence anyone may easily form their names in his own language, so that he which will may ask a physical angel, mathematical or philosophical, or an angel of civil wisdom, or of supernatural or natural wisdom, or for anything whatsoever. And let him ask seriously, with great desire of his mind, and with faith and constancy, and without doubt, that which he asketh, he shall receive from the Father and God of all spirits. This faith surmounteth all seals, and bringeth them into subjection to the will of man. The characteristical manner of calling angels succeedeth this faith which dependeth only on divine revelation. But without the said faith preceding it, it lieth in obscurity. Nevertheless, if any one will use them for a memorial, and not otherwise, and as a thing simply created by God to his purpose, to which such a spiritual power or essence is bound, he may use them without any offense unto God. But let him beware lest he fall into idolatry and the snares of the devil, who, with his cunning sorceries, easily deceiveth the unwary. And he is not taken but only by the finger of God, and is appointed to the service of man, 
so that they unwillingly serve the godly, but not without temptations and tribulations, because the commandment hath it that he shall bruise the heel of Christ, the seed of the woman. We are, therefore, to exercise ourselves about spiritual things with fear and trembling and with great reverence toward God, and to be conversant in spiritual essences with gravity and justice. And he which meddleth with such things, let him beware of all levity, pride, covetousness, vanity, envy, and ungodliness, unless he will miserably perish. Aphorism 28 Because all good is from God, who is only good, those things which we would obtain of him, we ought to seek them by prayer in spirit and truth, and a simple heart. The conclusion of the secret of secrets is that everyone exercise himself in prayer for those things which he desires, and he shall not suffer a repulse. Let not anyone despise prayer, for by whom God is prayed unto, to him he both can and will give. Now let us acknowledge him the author, from whom let us humbly seek for our desires. A merciful and good father loveth the sons of desires, as Daniel, and sooner heareth us than we are able to overcome the hardness of our hearts to pray. But he will not that we give holy things to dogs, nor despise and condemn the gifts of his treasury. Therefore, diligently and often read over and over the first septenary of secrets, and guide and direct thy life and all thy thoughts according to those precepts. And all things shall yield to the desires of thy mind in the Lord, to whom thou trustest. The Fifth Septenary Aphorism 29 As our study of magic proceedeth in order from general rules premised, let us now come to a particular explication thereof. Spirits either are divine ministers of the world, and of the church, and the members thereof, or else they are servient to the creatures in corporal things, partly for the salvation of the soul and body, and partly for its destruction. And there is nothing done, whether good or evil, without a certain and determinate order and government. He that seeketh after a good end, let him follow it, and he that desires an evil end, pursueth that also, and that earnestly, from divine punishment, and turning away from the divine will. Therefore, let every one compare his ends with the word of God, and as a touchstone that will judge between good and evil, and let him propose unto himself what is to be avoided, and what is to be sought after. And that which he constituteth and determineth unto himself, let him diligently, not procrastinating or delaying, until he attain his appointed bound. Aphorism 30 They which desire riches, glory of this world, magistracy, honors, dignities, tyrannies, and that magically, if they endeavor diligently after them, they shall obtain them, every one, according to his destiny, industry, and magical sciences, as the history of Melusina witnesseth, and the magicians thereof, who ordained that none of the Italian nations should forever obtain the rule or kingdom of Naples, and brought it to pass that he who reigned in his age to be thrown down from his seat, so great is the power of the guardian or tutelar angels of kingdoms of the world. Aphorism 31 Call the prince of the kingdom, and lay a command upon him, and command what thou wilt, and it shall be done, 
if that prince be not again absolved from his obedience by a succeeding magician. Therefore, the kingdom of Naples may be again restored to the Italians if any magician shall call him who instituted this order and compel him to recall his deed. He may be compelled also to restore the secret powers taken from the treasury of magic, a book, a gem, and a magical horn, which, being had, any one may easily, if he will, make himself the monarch of the world. But Eudaeus chose rather to live among gods, until the judgment, before the transitory good of this world. And his heart is so blind, that he understandeth nothing of the god of heaven and earth, or thinketh more, but enjoyeth the delights of things immortal, to his own eternal destruction. And he may be easier called up than the angel of Plotinus in the temple of Isis. Aphorism 32 In like manner also, the Romans were taught by the Sibyls, books. In like manner also, the Romans were taught by the Sibyls' books, and by that means made themselves the lords of the world, as history's witness. But the lords of the prince of a kingdom do bestow the lesser magistracies. He, therefore, that desireth to have a lesser office or dignity, let him magically call a noble of the prince, and his desire shall be fulfilled. Aphorism 33 But he who coveteth contemptible dignities as riches alone, let him call the prince of riches, or one of his lords, and he shall obtain his desire in that kind, whereby he would grow rich either in earthly goods or merchandise, or with the gifts of princes, or by the study of metals or chemistry. As he produceth any precedent of growing rich by these means, he shall obtain his desire therein. Aphorism 34 All manner of evocation is of the same kind and form, and this way was familiar of old time to the sibyls and chief priests. This in our time, through ignorance and impiety, is totally lost, and that which remaineth is depraved with infinite lies and superstitions. Aphorism 35 The human understanding is the only effector of all wonderful works, so that it be joined to any spirit. And being joined, she produceth what she will. Therefore, we are careful to proceed in magic, lest that sirens and other monsters deceive us, which likewise do desire the society of the human soul. Let the magician carefully hide himself always under the wings of the Most High, lest he offer himself to be devoured of the roaring lion. For they who desire earthly things do very hardly escape the snares of the devil. The Sixth Septenary Aphorism 36 Care is to be taken that experiments be not mixed with experiments, but that every one be only simple and several. For God and nature have ordained all things to a certain and appointed end, so that, for example's sake, they who perform cures with the most simple herbs and roots do cure the most happily of all. Then in this manner, in constellations, words and characters, stones and such like, do lie hid the greatest influences or virtues in deed, which are instead of a miracle. So also are words, which, being pronounced, do forthwith cause creatures both visible and invisible to yield obedience, as well creatures of this our world, as of the watery, airy, subterranean, olympic, supercelestial, and infernal, and also the divine. Therefore, simplicity is chiefly to be studied, 
and the knowledge of such simples is to be sought for from God. Otherwise, by no other means or experience, they can be found out. Aphorism 37 And let all lots have their place decently. Order, reason, and means are the three things which do easily render all learning as well of the visible as invisible creatures. This is the course of order. That some creatures are creatures of the light, others of darkness. These are subject to vanity, because they run headlong into darkness and enthrall themselves in eternal punishments for their rebellion. Their kingdom is partly very beautiful in transitory and corruptible things on the one part, because it cannot consist without some virtue and great gifts of God, and partly most filthy and horrid to be spoken of, because it aboundeth with all wickedness and sin, idolatry, contempt of God, blasphemies against the true God and his works, worshippers of devils, disobedience towards magistrates, seditions, homicides, robberies, tyranny, adulteries, wicked lusts, rape, thefts, lies, perjuries, pride, and a covetous desire of rule. In this mixture consisteth the kingdom of darkness. But the creatures of the light are filled with eternal truth, and with the grace of God, and are lords of the whole world, and do reign over the lords of darkness, as the members of Christ. Between these and the other there is continual war, until God shall put an end to their strife by his last judgment. Aphorism 38 Therefore, magic is twofold in its first division. The one is of God, which he bestoweth on the creatures of light. The other is also of God, but as it is, the gift which he giveth unto the creatures of darkness. And this is also twofold. The one is to do a good end, as when the princes of darkness are compelled to do good unto the creatures, God enforcing them. The other is for an evil end, when God permitteth such to punish evil persons, that magically they are deceived to destruction, or also he commandeth such to be cast out into destruction. The second division of magic is that it bringeth to pass some works with visible instruments through visible things, and it effecteth other works with invisible instruments by invisible things, and it acteth other things as well with mixed means as instruments and effects. The third division is, there are some things which are brought to pass by invocation of God alone. This is partly prophetical and philosophical, and partly, as it were, theophrastical. Other things there are by which reason of the ignorance of the true God are done with the princes of spirits, that his desires may be fulfilled. Such is the work of the Mercurialists. The fourth division is that some exercise their magic with the good angels instead of God as it were, descending down from the Most High God. Such was the magic of Balaam. Another magic is that which exerciseth their actions with the chief of the evil spirits. Such were they who wrought by the minor gods of the heathens. The fifth division is that some do act with spirits openly and face to face, which is given to few. Others do work by dreams and other signs, which the ancients took from their auguries and sacrifices. The sixth division is that some work by immortal creatures, others by mortal creatures, as nymphs, satyrs, and such like inhabitants of other elements, like pygmies, etc. The seventh division is that the spirits do serve some of their own accord without art, Others they will scarce attend, being called by art. Among these species of magic, 
That is the most excellent of all which dependeth upon God alone. The second, them whom the spirits do serve faithfully of their own accord. The third is that which is the property of Christians, which dependeth on the power of Christ, which he hath in heaven and earth. Aphorism 39 There is a sevenfold preparation to learn the magic art. The first is to meditate day and night how to attain the true knowledge of God, both by his word revealed from the foundation of the world, as also by the seal of creation and of the creatures, and by the wonderful effects which the visible and invisible creatures of God do show forth. Secondly, it is requisite that a man descend down into himself, and chiefly study to know himself, what mortal part he hath in him, and what immortal, and what part is proper to himself, and what diverse. Thirdly, that he learn by the immortal part of himself to worship, love, and fear the eternal God, and to adore him in spirit and truth and with his mortal part, to do those things which he knoweth to be acceptable to God, and profitable to his neighbors. These are the three first and chiefest precepts of magic, wherein let every one prepare himself that covets to obtain true magic or divine wisdom, that he may be accounted worthy thereof, and one to whom the angelical creatures willingly do service, not occultly only, but manifestly and as it were, face to face. Fourthly, whereas every man is to be vigilant to see to what kind of life he shall be called from his mother's womb, that every one may know whether he be born to magic, and to what species thereof, which every one may perceive easily that readeth these things, and by experience may have success therein, for such things and such gifts are not given but only to the low and humble. In the fifth place, we are to take care that we understand when the spirits are assisting us in undertaking the greatest business. And he that understands this, it is manifest that he shall be made a magician of the ordination of God, that is, such a person who useth the ministry of the spirits to bring excellent things to pass. Here, as for the most part, they sin, either through negligence, ignorance, or contempt, or by too much superstition. They offend also by ingratitude towards God, whereby many famous men have afterwards drawn upon themselves destruction. They sin also by rashness and obstinacy, and also when they do not use their gifts for that honor of God which is required. Sixthly, the magician hath need of faith and taciturnity, especially that he disclose no secret which the Spirit hath forbid him, as he commanded Daniel to seal some things, that is, not to declare them in public. So as it was not lawful for Paul to speak openly of all things which he saw in a vision. No man will believe how much is contained in this one precept. Seventhly, In him that would be a magician, there is required the greatest justice, that he undertake nothing that is ungodly, wicked, or unjust, nor to let it once come into his mind, and so he shall be divinely defended from all evil. When the magician determineth with himself to do any incorporeal thing, either with any exterior or interior sense, then let him govern himself according to these seven subsequent laws to accomplish his magical end. The first law is this, that he know that such a spirit is ordained unto him from God, and let him meditate that God is the beholder of all his thoughts and actions. Therefore, let him direct all the course of his life according to the rule prescribed in the word of God. Secondly, always pray with David, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, and strengthen me with thy free spirit, 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, do not give power to any lying spirit, as thou didst over Ahab that he perished, but keep me in thy truth. Amen. Thirdly, let him accustom himself to try the spirits, as the scripture admonisheth, for grapes cannot be gathered of thorns. Let us try all things, and hold fast that which is good and laudable, that we may avoid everything that is repugnant to the divine power. The fourth is, to be remote and clear from all manner of superstition. For this is superstition, to attribute divinity in this place to things wherein there is nothing at all divine, or to choose or frame to ourselves to worship God with some kind of worship which he hath not commanded. Such are the magical ceremonies of Satan, whereby he impudently offereth himself to be worshipped as God. The fifth thing to be eschewed is all worship of idols, which bindeth any divine power to idols or other things of their own proper motion, where they are not placed by the Creator or by the order of nature, which things many false and wicked magicians feign. Sixthly, all the deceitful imitations and affectations of the devil are also to be avoided, whereby he imitateth the power of the creation and of the Creator, that he may so produce things with a word, that they may not be what they are, which belongeth only to the omnipotency of God, and is not communicable to the creature. Seventhly, let us cleave fast to the gifts of God, and of his Holy Spirit, that we may know them, and diligently embrace them with our whole heart and all our strength. Aphorism 41 we come now to the nine last aphorisms of this whole tome, wherewith we will, the divine mercy assisting us, conclude this whole magical isagogy. Therefore, in the first place it is to be observed what we understand by magician in this work. Him then we count to be a magician, to whom by the grace of God the spiritual essences do serve to manifest the knowledge of the whole universe, and of the secrets of nature contained therein, whether they are visible or invisible. This description of a magician plainly appeareth, and is universal. An evil magician is he whom, by the divine permission of the evil spirits, do serve, to his temporal and eternal destruction and perdition, to deceive men, and draw them away from God. Such was Simon Magus, of whom mention is made in the Acts of the Apostles, and in Clement of Alexandria, whom St. Peter commanded to be thrown down upon the earth, as when he had commanded himself, as it were, a god, to be raised up into the air by the unclean spirits. Unto this order are also to be referred all those who are noted in the Twelve Tables of the Law, and are set forth with their evil deeds. The subdivision and species of both kinds of magic we will note in the tomes following. In this place it shall suffice that we distinguish the sciences, which is good and which is evil, whereas man sought to obtain them both at first to his own ruin and destruction, as Moses and Hermes do demonstrate. Aphorism 42 Secondly, we are to know that a magician is a person predestinated to this work from his mother's womb. Neither let him assume any such great things to himself, unless he be called divinely by grace hereunto for some good end. To a bad end is, that the scripture might be fulfilled, it must be that offenses will come, but woe be to that man through whom they come. Therefore, as we have before oftentimes admonished, with fear and trembling we must live in this world. 
Notwithstanding, I will not deny, but that some men may with study and diligence obtain some species of both kinds of magic, if it may be admitted. But he shall never aspire to the highest kinds thereof. Yet, if he covet to assail them, he shall doubtless offend both in soul and body. Such are they who, by the operations of false magicians, are sometimes carried to Mount Horeb, or in some wilderness or deserts, or they are maimed in some member, or are simply torn to pieces, or are deprived of their understanding, even as many such things happen by the use thereof, where men are forsaken by God, and delivered to the power of Satan. The Seventh Septenary Aphorism 43 The Lord liveth, and the works of God do live in him by his appointment, whereby he willeth them to be. For he will have them to use their liberty in obedience to his commands, or disobedience thereof. To the obedient he hath proposed their reward. To the disobedient he hath propounded their deserved punishment. Therefore, these spirits, of their free will, through their pride and contempt of the Son of God, have revolted from God their Creator, and are reserved unto the day of wrath. And there is left in them a very great power in the creation, but notwithstanding, it is limited, and they are confined to their bounds with the bridle of God. Therefore, The magician of God, which signifies a wise man of God, or one informed of God, is led forth by the hand of God unto all everlasting good, both mean things and also the chiefest corporal things. Great is the power of Satan by reason of the great sins of men. Therefore also the magicians of Satan do perform great things, and greater than any man would believe, although they do subsist in their own limits, nevertheless, they are above all human apprehension as to the corporal and transitory things of this life, which many ancient histories and daily examples do testify. Both kinds of magic are different one from the other in their ends. The one leadeth to eternal good, and useth temporal things with thanksgiving, The other is a little solicitous about eternal things, but wholly exerciseth himself about corporal things, that he may freely enjoy all his lusts and delights in contempt of God and his anger. Aphorism 44 The passage from the common life of man unto a magical life is no other but a sleep from that life, and an awakening to this life. For those things which happen to ignorant and unwise men in their common life, the same things happen to the willing and knowing magician. The magician understandeth when the mind doth meditate of himself. He deliberateth, reasoneth, constituteth, and determineth what is to be done. He observeth when his cogitations do proceed from a divine separate essence, and he proveth of what order that divine separate essence is. But the man that is ignorant of magic is carried to and fro, as it were, in war with his affections. He knoweth not when they issue out of his own mind, or are impressed by the assisting essence, and he knoweth not how to overthrow the counsels of his enemies by the word of God, or to keep himself from the snares and deceits of the tempter. Aphorism 45 The greatest precept of magic is to know what every man ought to receive for his use from the assisting spirit, and what to refuse, which he may learn from the psalmist, saying, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way, in keeping thy word, O Lord? To keep the word of God so that the evil one snatch it not out of the heart is the chiefest precept of wisdom. 
It is lawful to admit of and exercise other suggestions which are not contrary to the glory of God, and charity towards our neighbors, not inquiring from what spirit such suggestions proceed. But we ought to take heed that we are not too much busied with unnecessary things according to the admonition of Christ. Martha, Martha, thou art troubled about many things. But Mary hath chosen the better part which shall not be taken from her. Therefore, let us always have regard unto the saying of Christ, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All other things, that is, all things which are due to the mortal microcosm, as food, raiment, and the necessary arts of this life. Aphorism 46. There is nothing that so much becometh a man as constancy in his words and deeds, and when the like rejoiceth in his like. There are none more happy than such, because the holy angels are conversant about such, and possess the custody of them. On the contrary, men that are unconstant are lighter than nothing, and rotten leaves. We choose the forty-six aphorism from these. Even as every one governeth himself, so he allureth unto himself spirits of his nature and condition. But one very truly adviseth that no man should carry himself beyond his own calling, lest that he draw unto himself some malignant spirit from the uttermost parts of the earth, by whom either he shall be infatuated and deceived, or brought to final destruction. This precept appeareth most plainly, for Midas, when he would convert all things into gold, drew up such a spirit unto himself, which was able to perform this, and being deceived by him, he had been brought to death by famine, if his foolishness had not been corrected by the mercy of God. The same thing happened to a certain woman about Frankfurt at Odera in our times, who would scrape together and devour money of anything. Would that men would diligently weigh this precept, and not account the histories of Midas and the like for fables. They would be much more diligent in moderating their thoughts and affections, neither would they be so perpetually vexed with the spirits of the golden mountains of Utopia. Therefore, we ought most diligently to observe that such presumptions should be cast out of the mind, by the word, while they are new. Neither let them have any habit in the idle mind that is empty of the divine word. Aphorism 47 He that is faithfully conversant in his vocation shall have also the Spirit's constant companions of his desires, who will successively supply him in all things. But if he have any knowledge in magic, they will not be unwilling to show him, and familiarly to converse with him, and to serve him in those several ministries unto which they are addicted. The good spirits in good things unto salvation, the evil spirits in every evil thing to destruction. Examples are not wanting in the histories of the whole world, and do daily happen in the world. Theodosius, before the victory of Arbogastus, is an example of the good. Brute, before he was slain, was an example of the evil spirits, when he was persecuted of the spirit of Caesar, and exposed to punishment, that he slew himself, who had slain his own father, and the father of his country. Aphorism 48 all magic is the revelation of spirits of that kind, of which sort the magic is. So that the nine muses are called, in Hesiod, the ninth magic, as he manifestly testifies of himself in Theogony. In Homer, the genius of Ulysses in Psychagogia. Hermes, the spirits of the more sublime parts of the mind. God revealed himself to Moses in the bush. 
The three wise men who came to seek Christ at Jerusalem, the angel of the Lord was their leader. The angels of the Lord directed Daniel. Therefore there is nothing whereof any one may glory, for it is not unto him that willeth, nor unto him that runneth, but to whom God will have mercy, or of some other spiritual fate. From hence springeth all magic, and thither again it will revolve, whether it be good or evil. In this manner, Tages, the first teacher of the magic of the Romans, gushed out of the earth. Diana, of the Ephesians, showed her worship as if it had been sent from heaven. So also Apollo. And all the religions of the heathens is taken from the same spirits. Neither are the opinions of the Sadducees human inventions. Aphorism 49 The conclusion, therefore, of this isagogy is the same which we have above already spoken of, that even as there is one God, from whence is all good, and one sin, to wit disobedience, against the will of the commanding God, from whence comes all evil, so that the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom, and the profit of all magic. For obedience to the will of God followeth the fear of God, and after this do follow the presence of God, and of the Holy Spirit, and the ministry of the holy angels, and all good things out of the inexhaustible treasures of God. But unprofitable and damnable magic ariseth from this, where we lose the fear of God out of our hearts and suffer sin to reign in us, there the prince of this world, the God of this world, beginneth and setteth up his kingdom instead of holy things, in such as he findeth profitable for his kingdom. There, even as a spider taketh the fly which falleth into his web, so Satan spreadeth abroad his nets, and taketh men with the snares of covetousness, until he sucketh him, and draweth him to eternal fire. These he cherisheth, and advanceth on high, that their fall may be greater. Courteous Reader Apply thy eyes and mind to the sacred and profane histories, and to those things which thou seest daily to be done in the world, and thou shalt find all things full of magic, according to a twofold science, good and evil, which, that they may be better discerned, we will put here in their division and subdivision for the conclusion of these isagogies, wherein every one may contemplate what is to be followed and which is to be avoided, and how far it is to be labored for by every one to a competent end of life and living. You've been listening to Arbitel of Magic, translated into English by Robert Turner, read by Dan Attrell. If you'd like to support the production of more work such as this, please visit patreon.com slash themodernhermeticist. Thank you for listening.